G'day guys, I'm Simon Christie. This week we're in the beautiful Mount Disappointment State Forest. Simon was telling us about this quarry. He learned to full drive in this area. It was too good a challenge for some to ignore. The full drive system wasn't working in the camera car. This thing is a lot bigger when you see it doing that. It's time to really put down the Colorado. We've got over the hump bit. Uh oh. <laughs> Simon said, right, let's go on a night drive. Who's in? Anyone want to have a look at the creek before we drive into it? Yeah, this is a bit intense. This is Life Off Road. Mount Disappointment never disappoints, and let's go and find out why. Alright guys, we are heading up into the Mount Disappointment State Forest. Great little place to learn your four-wheel driving, medium to hard tracks. Great change in terrain. It's one of the closest spots to Melbourne and there's a fair bit of history up here. So after Spur Road, we turned into Mount Disappointment Forest itself, pulled down into the track and got ready and prepared and aired down. This forest up here was affected by the fires back in 2009. It was pretty much obliterated. Great to see it recovering. We drive along, the bush is thick and green again. A lot of burnt trees around. Let's not hide the history here, you can see it. But butterflies are out and about. We've got deer prints around. We've got action happening in the forest again. So it's really nice to see it recovering. Rob, have you been up in the Mount Disappointment before? No, we were just actually commenting on how the terrain's a bit different than what I was expecting. Yeah, this side of the mountain's quite dry and rocky, so there'll be a few hill climbs, it's gonna be fairly shaly, a couple of rock ledges here and there. Should be good fun. I'm very excited. After a bit of a short transit, we headed towards the first hill climb. On our way down the descent towards the hill climb, the camera crew called out and let us know that the full drive system in the car wasn't working in the camera car. So they actually got stuck halfway up the hill and then sort of pulled back into the side of it and left the vehicle there, waited for the convoy to go past. Something interesting on the real steep climb was seeing how all the different eras of vehicle and different styles of vehicle tackle that steep terrain. She's a doozy, nice and steep. A couple of little washouts here and there. This thing is a lot bigger when you see it doing that, isn't it? Rob and the Razzler team, give it a red hot crack, guys, into it. I was amazed, the 300 series with all its modern tech, just how easy, you don't need diff locks, you don't need anything, it just drives up like a Sunday drive. The big 300 has done it with ease. Who's next up, Greg? Well, on the way, buddy. Camera car broken, I'll be going back to that one in a minute. Alright, all yours, Troy. Bring it up. We've got over the hump a bit. Yeah, boy, that's a bit of a rock step here. Did he go over that? It's reverse. Uh oh. <laughs> Secure it all our belongings. Ready to go? Send it, buddy, send it. Well, I said it was short, but that's a few hundred metres. This should be good fun. Good to go. No problem at all, so we're up the top now. Wasn't long before it was a, a bit of a change of plan and procedure. We had to get the camera car off the track. Simon jumped in the, in the driver's seat, thought he'd have a crack. He's tried to take off, it didn't go anywhere, reverse down the hill a bit. Given it the berries, charging up the hill. And got to exactly the same spot out to reliable winching time. Warner have been innovating in winches since back in the 50s. They started with the electric winch, 
and developed and developed. And in the 70s, they brought it the famous 18274. That winch sort of cemented them as being renowned worldwide. Warn are still evolving. They're bringing out products today that are way ahead. You buy a Warn, you're buying a product which is leading the market. When you're looking for a winch, do your homework, make sure you buy the best you can afford. So when you're out here, if something does go wrong, you know it's not gonna let you down, it's gonna get you out of trouble. In no time he is free and ready to tackle the next section of the track. Simon got to the top and we had a quick look at the car. The guys from Razzle climbed underneath and we're having a listen just to make sure that the actuator was actually functioning. Mechanically it's sound so we don't have a broken CV or anything like that, it's just purely an electric actuator. Got some mud or something in the plug, just not engaging like it should. Pretty meticulously maintained vehicle isn't it Simon? <laughs> <laughs> from there because I'd wound Simon up quite a bit, I got the job of the next hill I'll have to tow that car up. We believe it's time to really put down the Colorado. Put it out of its misery. Yep. Poor old car. Simon, please give me a new camera car. I need a camera car. <laughs> I need a new camera car. <laughs> Off to find the next obstacle. We're cruising through this really cool roller coaster section. It was just up and down, up and down, up and down. So you can feel yourself squirreling around a little bit. Oh, it's only mild concussion. <laughs> we went through a couple of, what do you call them, Tan? Alley-oops. Alley-oops. Low range, just let the car just idle down the hills, climbing back up and down again. It was pretty cool terrain there. It was absolutely superb scenery. Get down the bottom of the valley, the camera crew somehow managed to park it in a pretty weird spot, sort of on the track, mostly not. I tried to get it off the track and then um, it just kind of <laughs> fell into a hole. You didn't even get to the hill. <laughs> so as we know, the camera car unfortunately does not have four wheel drive. It's gonna be a little bit of a challenge getting it through the tracks. But, to make things a little bit more challenging, it seems that the driver of the camera car has somehow slid the camera car off the road Let's interview Michael to find out what happened because as four-wheel drivers, we're not really sure how this car ended up <laughs> there. <laughs> Look, I just wanted to get the car a little off the road so Rob could come rescue me and get me up the top of the hill. I just didn't see the ditch that I kind of went into. He's a photographer, not a four-wheel driver. Thanks, Michael. We got a few guys on the front and one on the back to try and counterbalance and get that rear wheel down. It actually popped out, which is amazing. But that was only the start of the trouble because next big hill was literally right in front of it. Backed up as far as possible and absolutely gave it to it. He didn't do bad, he actually got right near the very top before it went bad. Oh, so close. He kept his calm, he kept it straight to back down a little bit to realign. There goes the tail right? Simon taught me how to fall <laughs> I had to then try and squeeze around the outside of him, try and keep some pace so I didn't slide into him so we could do a snatch and recover him. For recovery, something like this will come in handy. Just released an awesome new product to market, which are our soft shackle friendly pink and blue recovery hitches. The kit comes with the recovery hitch and a colour coded soft shackle. Part of this initiative, we're donating $5 from each unit to the McGrath Foundation and the Beyond Blue Foundation. Link to the colours. They're full of features and function that are great for the genuine four-wheel driver. Jump onto the RoadSafe website, find a store anywhere in Australia. Hooked up the snatch strap to Simon's car. Once we are in place, we had good traction. Rope took up, snap the strap did its job. It stretched and put some kinetic energy into that recovery and brought the vehicle up behind it did a really easy job on a pretty steep hill. With his little bit of drive from two-wheel drive and us dragging him, we got moving really easy and got him up around the corner and up to the flat ground again. So when we get to camp, we'll give this to Simon, the instrument that did all the damage to his car, and he can have a sacrificial burning of it. Might be a cathartic experience for him. Let's see how we go. Given I could barely walk up that hill, it's gonna be fun driving it. And a little kitty catcher. We had no problems getting up that section, did we? No, luckily. <laughs> no. Not sure what was going on with Simon. Not sure if it was like. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Simon probably cleaned up a lot of the slippery stuff off there, washed it off the side of the track for us. Can we cruise up there with the trailer? The diff lock on definitely helped that one, that's for sure. This area is actually a hot spot for deer. Definitely worth keeping your eyes open for any sign of deer through here. Simon will run and tackle and take onto the ground. Something down there just on the left worth having a look at, I reckon. So we've all jumped out, walked down a really steep hill. Do you want me to come and hold your hand too? Wouldn't mind. <laughs> and as we got to the bottom of it, he's gone, this here is called a deer wallow. Yeah, look at that. It's a pretty common spot for hunters to go and sit and wait for the deer to congregate. So these are all deer prints. Water from winter would remain in that sort of low section there. Basically a swimming pool for deer. It's a bit of a muddy puddle. They come in, use it to meet other deer and do other deer things. They actually won't become active till about two, three o'clock in the morning. Have a look at that. Interesting to see, there's actually a few hides set up, people in building. Not just one, there was multiple hides. They were pretty impressive, to be honest. Once you're behind them, you couldn't see the person whatsoever. <laughs> to whack a gun through that hole. The Mount Simon talks about knives and guns. The last thing I would have wanted to be is a deer in that area where we were today. I like guns. It was cool to have a look and learn and teach a few guys I'd never seen before what they do. All of those deer hunters that come out here into these areas are driving a four-wheel drive. It's a huge and important demographic of the four-wheel drive industry. All right, let's move on. Guys, we're coming down to a nice little scenic spot. I reckon there's room here for us to pull over, crack out the awnings and have a little bit of lunch. We all had a really good break. A bit of a chat and explore around the area, look at the creek. Quick chicken wrap, then we headed on to the next area. So Rob, you wanted something a little bit harder. I think I've got something that's probably impossible, but there may be a little bit more challenge down there for you. Where are we talking about? We're driving towards it. Simon was telling us about this quarry and when he was younger. He learned to full drive in this area in his 40 series. All right guys, this is a fun little play area. Should be enjoyable. It was clearly an old source of rock. They'd taken great big chunks of it out of there over the years. And off to the right, there was a really gnarly, steep, rocky, rutted hill climb. A few of the guys walked at first, and as you got to the top, you could clearly see a lots of holes dug in the track and erosion banks set up. Simon was telling us that he used to be able to drive like almost vertical up on this wall. I couldn't resist to have a bit of a play and try and stick my 300 series up the same spot after he'd wound me up all day that I wouldn't. And the story Simon is telling us, it's changed an awful lot over the years. It used to be a big lake in the middle and the dirt was a lot higher on the sides. It became undrivable but it was too good a challenge for some to ignore. That's right. <laughs> I was only gonna nose up to it and see how bad it is. Feels a lot steeper than it looks. Rob decided to not commit to the top, <laughs> which was probably a wise move. It's a shame you can't drive up over the top, because once you got there, it looked like, yeah. like you'd be easy, comfortable yeah. over the top. There was no point trying to drive the whole thing. We start heading for camp. Come on boy, just up ahead we're going to pull into our campsite for the night and there should be enough room to fit us all in. New to me, this is actually an old POW camp from World War II I believe. There's a lot of history here. It's a great spot, it's got a spot to have a campfire and toilets, it's fantastic. We set the swags up, set our bedding up brought along one of our new swags, the Dirty D Plus. It's the same size and shape as the normal Dirty D, but it's got a hutch built in on the end, which is a great little storage area. Gives you room for your wet, muddy boots, so you don't have to put them on your bedding. Gives you a place to store a gear bag for the Dirty D, including our new unbreakable composite poles. It'd be a nice, quick, easy setup, and one of the camera crew will get to sleep in that tonight.
Now tonight I'm doing something a little bit different for me and the crew are gonna love it. We are cooking up beef souvlakis. So let's get cooking and get dinner underway. Meat's ready to go. I am absolutely starving, and I know you guys can't smell it, but it's delicious. This is going to be awesome. Let's start serving this up. Just made it. Right, Michael. That might be the best yet. For our vegetarian, we've got some halloumi. There you go, Ethan. Well, guys, there's souvlaki's done, Simon Christie style. I'll tell you what, that was quick, simple, and easy. A little bit of preparation, meat pre-marinated, but these are awesome, good to go. With a little bit of winding Simon up that maybe that day's tracks weren't tough enough for us, he said, right, let's go on a night drive, who's in? It gave us a great opportunity to test out the Nava 215s and also the new Nava Ultima 8 inch and 24 inch bars that Simon's just recently fitted to the truck. I've now done a couple of trips, Evan, with the Ultima Mark IIs, but now the last trip, I've got the Ultima light bars. And let me tell you guys, no joke, my eyes are a bit sensitive, but I drove with sunglasses on at night time. These, this package is just so bright. So these are our Ultima 8 inch bars. Two of these are equivalent to a pair of our 180s. And we've got the Ultima 24 inch bars up the top there. And one of those bars is equivalent to a pair of the older 215s in output. So you're getting about 700 meters distance out of those floods, they're a wide flood. And you're getting about a 100 meter wide beam at 500 meters length. They're pretty insane, Simon. There's a bit of a hint about a night drive tonight. An old fart like me, that's all good. I'm gonna look after the campfire. I'll let them all go play. So you could really see on our night drive, you get what you pay for with your lights, because they're amazing. All right, guys, we're here at the crossing now. The burnt out bridge is still there, a couple of logs remain, but we've got a drop off to the right, it's a bit of a steep drop off, a little bit of a rock shelf to cross over, and a bit of a step up out the other side. Low range, let's give it a crack. Oh yeah, dropped off that one. Guys, that was a nice, easy drive. As we approached it, it dropped off down to the right-hand side. Pretty sharp incline. Let's get Rob through. There was one real sharp rock sticking out on the exit. Yeah. The number one thing you need to think about when buying a bull bar is strength versus weight. Your average triple hoop run of the mill bull bar are all around the 90 to 100 kilos. We can normally get all those accessories fitted in a bar that will still protect everything, similar to this one that's around the 50 55. Normally, once you've got your bull bar, you move on to a rock slider slash sidestep. There's a lot of companies make them big tube, 60 mil tube, some do 40 mil tube. We try to go with the 50 mil, so it's a nice intermediate, nice compromise that you've still got super strength without being crazy on the weight. Pretty cool little track, the others missed out. Mount Disappointment never disappoints. Yeah, watch out for the camera, man. We have plenty more from this trip coming your way that will challenge our vehicles and drivers. This will be interesting. But next week, we've got something completely different as we head to the Outback for Ruby Gap and beyond. Stop, stop, stop! Please let me go! Please let me go first! I'm doing something! Thank you.